Sylvie swished around her cabin, spritzing perfume on her pulse point, singing, We're in the money, with great gusto, but not really knowing the words. Oh, that's right, honey. We're in the money tonight. You are so handsome. I am so pretty. Do, do, do. We're in the money. Oh, that's right, honey. We'll get rid of old Violet. Do, do, do. As quick as a bunny. As Sylvie stepped up. Sorry about that, by the way. As Sylvie stepped into her cream-colored cocktail dress, she realized she hadn't been so excited about a man for a long time. Too long. Milton was just so nice, and what a gentleman. Spending time with him today had been the double-edged sword of reminding her what she's been missing since Harold died. Forget the other creep she married. He didn't count. But her life with Harold had been special. This afternoon, Milton had unknowingly brought on a reassurance of those feelings of how right it can be when you're with someone and there's chemistry. When the old bat Violet had finally gone to take a nap, losing around two, Sylvie and her ear patch, she and Melton had gone for a walk around the deck. He had taken off his sweater and put it around her shoulders when the wind started to pick up. She had felt like a high school cheerleader whose boyfriend had just given her his football jacket. Don't get carried away, Sylvie thought to herself as she fastened the hook on her dress. But I do hope some of my perfume stayed on his sweater. And when he wears it again, he'll be reminded of me. Nothing like a smell to bring back memories. With my luck, Big Sis will have borrowed it, and he'll get it back smelling like Ben Gay. Sylvie glanced at her watch. 6.45. I better get going, she thought as she reflected on all the times when she felt so alone at these captain parties. How depressing. Well, tonight would be different. She had plans to meet up with Milton and Violet and then would introduce them to people from her table, especially Lady Exner. If that failed, she enlisted the help of Gavin, Gavin to entertain the heartily shrinking Violet. That settled in her mind, she freshened her lipstick and started to sing, Tonight, tonight, won't be just any night. Nora helped, helped Luke with the studs on his tuxedo cuffs. I don't know how guys who live alone can get these things on, he commented. Well, I'm not going to let you have the chance to find out how they do it, Nora smiled up at him. You look so handsome, especially in black. As our daughter would say, it's for good for business. Luke smiled back at her and leaned down for a kiss. Nora frowned. Luke, I'm so worried about her. Luke realized he should have never brought Reagan's name into the conversation. After the psychic session that afternoon, Nora has been a wreck. He had finally managed to talk some sense into her, and now it was starting to start all over again. Honey, it'll be just a few more days on the ship, and then she'll be back at work, dealing with real criminals again. That's when we're allowed to worry. Not when she's minding a harmless old woman in the best suite of the ship. He hugged her. Now, go back to thinking about who she should have married. <laughs> Nora laughed reluctantly and gave him a playful punch. All right, you, but I'll be relieved when we are all off this ship. Me too. I'm anxious to hear, hear of her opinion on my version of, of a green room. Reagan followed Veronica out of their suite, not expecting to cruise home. Reagan had not bought many dressy clothes on her trip. Clad in a deceptively simple black cocktail dress, she provided some. She provided quite a contrast to Veronica's silver taffeta ball gown, the rejected outfit of the night before. All I need is a white apron, and people will think I'm tra her traveling maid. Reagan thought. As the elevator door closed on the hoop of Veronica's dress, Reagan pushed all the f buttons in a frantic effort to save the dress from being ruined. She needn't have worried. When she finally managed to free Veronica's glad rings from the groaning, buzzing, jammed door, the hoop immediately sprung back into its original shape. It's crush-proof, Reagan thought with amazement. That must have been ghosts of fashion police trying to destroy it. Ew! Veronica
Rebecca cried. Thank you, Reagan. I'm so glad it didn't rip. Rip, Reagan thought. That thing is made of U.S. steel. No problem at all. You look so pretty, Veronica. And so do you, my dear. But I would love to take you shopping and really dress you up with some hoopa. For example, you will look lovely in a dress like this. Would you believe I bought it off the peg? Yes, Reagan thought. Gavin entered the Queen's room with a nervous air. The band was playing softly in the background. The captain and his senior management team spit and polished in their dress whites were ready to meet and greet the first class passengers. The ship's photographer had his equipment set up, ready to snap passengers as they flanked the captain. It was a great money maker on these cruise lines. Even though the photos were outrageously pricely, not many tourists could resist buying the mementos of their trip. Mm. Oh, excuse me. That went on sale as fast as the photography staff could get them on display. Some people bought them to get their highly unflattering likenesses out of the display cases where they were subject to the scrutiny of their fellow travelers. I better do some good mixing tonight, Gavin thought, unnaturally. If I don't get that bracelet soon, I'll need to, a lot of spare time to f spend only with Veronica. The apparition sent a wave of anxiety sweeping through his body. He forced a smile and walked over to say hello to the captain. Gavin reached out his hand. Good evening, sir. Thanks to the fact that Veronica was so anxious to get to the party, she and Reagan were one of the first people in line to meet the captain. Within a few moments of their arrival, the line sneaked out to the door and passed the Lancelot bar. Dutifully, the captain put his arms around both of them as Veronica tittered, Cheese! Though the captain did his best to be charming, Reagan was relieved after the unusual plenteries were exchanged. As Veronica attempted to linger with him, Reagan accepted a glass of champagne from a passing waiter and looked around. The early birds have already staked out seats on the couches and chairs that formed a horseshoe around the dance floor. Oh, Reagan, over here! Reagan turned to her left and saw Sylvie waving to them. She, would see she was seated on one of the couches next to an older gentleman. Veronica, let's go over and say hello to Sylvie. Lovely, dear. Come on, on. As they made their way over, the band started to play a version of Chattanooga Choo Choo, complete with squishy sounds made by the drummer's instrument that sounded like a miniature, miniature broom. Even though the, most people her age hated this kind of music, usually played at weddings, Reagan did a ki get a kick out of it. She noticed one couple out on the dance floor as they started their own little two-step, joining hands and twirling, knowing each other's moves without even looking, gracefully dancing together, as they probably have been doing for the past 40 years. By the time I celebrate my 40th anniversary, as someone Reagan thought, the only way we'll be able to move around the dance floor together would be if someone wheeled us back and forth out there. A dancer and a waiter both tripped on Veronica's hoop before they reached Sylvie. Lady Exner, the woman seated next to Sylvie, looked up worshipfully. Yes. Sil Gerbert Exner's widow. Veronica seemed delighted that finally No, delighted that someone finally recognized her status before she had to inform them. Introductions were made. Veronica sat down on the ch on the chairs nearest Violet. Sylvie was glowing. Reagan thought as she sat down in the chair opposite of Veronica and next to Milton. As the room filled, white-gloved waiters passed champagne. The band played on, and the noise level increased to that of a full-blown cocktail pottery. Chatter and laughter filled the air as people appraised each other's outfits and finally got the chance in the convivial atmosphere to say hello to fellow passengers they had not met yet. Cameron Hardwick leaned against the column, sipping his champagne and sneaking an occasional glance over at Veronica and Reagan. The future flotsam and jetsam, he thought to himself. Hopefully he did, she didn't wear that gown to bed Friday night. 
It would serve as a parachute all the way down the side of the ship. She stayed afloat for days. He turned away when he saw the old biddy from the afternoon pointing him out to Veronica. I don't need those two comparing notes, he thought angrily. I just know that young man waited on us at Crease over ten years ago. Violet confined to Veronica. It was after my dear Bruce died. He insisted this afternoon when I mentioned it to him that he's never been to Greece. But I know for sure he's mistaken. It was in August 11 years ago. We had a window table and I ordered stuffed, stuffed shrimp. But they were out of it. When I couldn't make up my mind what to order, he got very impatient with me and to think we were paying top dollar to stay at that hotel. Violet said hauntly, We were discussing Greece at dinner last night, and he told us he's never been there. Veronica replied, I'm telling you, I know it was he. Violet humped, humped, I never forget a face. Veronica smiled, he's really quite nice. He took me for a stroll on the deck last night and offered me his arm. So protective. Maybe you'll like to query him again on Thursday evening. I've decided to have a cocktail party in our suite before dinner. I'm inviting everyone from my table, and I would be enchanted if you and your brother would join us. I'd love to show you pictures of Syl Gilbert and Llewellyn Hall. Violet looked as if the boil on her behind had finally burst. We'll be happy to be your guests. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Reagan thought as she took her seat at the dinner table. Here we all are to share our experiences for the full, first full day at sea. It didn't take too long for the sharing to start. Have any of you ever been wrapped in seaweed? And Michaela de began. I highly recommend it. It's a most tingly and refreshing experience. Veronica interjected. It sounds fascinating. What does it involve? It involves stripping the, the seven seas of every last trace of plant life to cover the frames of people who are too lazy to exercise, Gavin thought. Well, you have to make an appointment at the Beulah parlor downstairs, but you better do it soon because they are filling up their appointments books fast. Reagan, remember, we must remember to call the first thing in the morning. Veronica rejoiced as she waved the rest... rest Restricted cigarette holder. Even though it smells a little fishy, Emil Cat, Emil Cat, ah, oh, said as she wrinkled her nose. It's so worth it. They cover your body from head to toe in a creamy green mast mask, wrap you in a plastic and thermal blankets, and leave you to rest for a half hour while the seaweed flushes the toxins from your pores. After you shower it off, you get a massage while you listen to music of your choice. I tell you, I feel like a new woman. I told her that was fine, just as long as she stays deep down the same Emucleta Marie I married. Mario announced as he buttered his roll. I don't want you running off with one of the ship's officers now. Fat chance, Hardwick thought. And Michaela patted his back and laughed. Oh, Mario, and proceeded to tell about her facial. The thing that kills me is that they think that by insulating your skin that you'll get to buy all their products. The girl told me I have problems with my capillaries and then did a, did a pitch for a cream that cost $75. Can you believe that? Mario grunted. Well, you bought it, didn't you, honey? How could I resist? They guaranteed my skin would be baby soft and smooth by the time I used up the tube. It's not as if you can't even return it if it doesn't work, Reagan thought. The ship will be floating around the South Seas by the time you figure out that your corporeal problems are irreversible. Did you know, Emilia continued, that it is very important to brush your skin every morning with a natural bristle brush? Our Skin should shed over two pounds of flakes a day. So they sold her one of those brushes they, that they just happened to have on sale for another 35 bucks. 
Mario muttered as he examined a sem semi-seed seed breadstick. Oh, Mario, as she patted his cheek. Honestly, swallowing our skin is so important, especially around the rough spots like your elbows, your heels, your knees. That's why you exfoliate when you get up in the morning and when you go to bed at night. Gavin wondered if the salon played Old MacDonald had a farm when they, when they brushed their clients. The girl told me that by the time the average person throws away their mattress, it weighs an extra 25 pounds. And that's all from the dead skin that's accumulated. Okay, that's disgusting. <laughs> it's like sleeping with a dead body. Ew. No, I don't know if I'll be able to go to bed tonight. Thank you, book. It'll be more exciting than sleeping with my ex-wife, Gavin thought. Cameron Hardwick could barely contain himself. He pressed his lips closed. Cameron, dear, Lady Exner piped up. I've been spreading the word. Thursday night, Regan and I will be hosting a cocktail party before dinner in our suite. I hope you will make it. We have a thrilling view that's to die for. I know you do, Hardwick thought darkly. He smiled at her. Thank you. I will be there. How perfect. The suite across the hall is probably a mere image, but now I'll know for sure what to expect Friday night. Lovely, Veronica cried. That means that everyone will be in attendance, along with a few other friends we made today, and perhaps a few more we have not met yet. After dinner, I'm going straight upstairs to plan which or whores divorce will we will serve. That's my specialty, Gavin quivered, like a pot of water the second before it finally boils. I planned a lot of the celebrity parties my radio station sponsored. As a matter of fact, he turned and winked at Reagan. One famous author who shall remain nameless adored the scallops bacon I have always ordered for our annual Christmas bash. I think Nora went to that party once, Reagan thought. And, of course, on board ship, I have helped many of our guests plan private sororities. Lady Exner, please allow me to assist you this evening. I'm sure Reagan might like a chance to join some of the younger folks down at the disco. What younger folks, Reagan thought. Gavin realized his armpits were drenched, and he felt lightheaded as Veronica agreed hardly. You are too kind, she cried. How lucky are we to have been placed at your table? Aren't we lucky, Reagan? Very lucky. I'm sure Reagan would, would welcome the opportunity to expand her horizon by socializing and the disco this evening. Would you, Reagan? I am always looking to expand my horizons. Good. It is settled then. Mr. Gray will make party plans with me, and you will go forward and mingle. Veronica made a swooping notion with her hands. Maybe you'll dance with that young man who smiled at you during bingo. <laughs> Pigs in a blanket have always been a favorite whore's divorce of mine, Veronica pronounced as she plopped down next to Gavin on a pastel couch. Although I'm afraid some people find them common. Sir Gilbert loved them to excess. I shall never forget the time he popped one in his mouth and his eyes took on a glazed look. I panicked and started pounding on his frail back. This was before the Heimlich maneuver was invented. Gavin waited in expert expert expertly for the final word on Sil Gilbert's fate. Veronica sighed. Turns out he was just fine. Just taking a little snooth with his eyes open. It happens more and more as one gets older. It was very near the end of him and the poor dear's health was failing rapidly. I was just glad that he had the chance to enjoy one of his favorite treats just days before he departed this planet for points unknown. Veronica paused, opened the special menu for private parties, and smiled to herself. Happily, he enjoyed his favorite treat in the world just moments before he died. Veronica turned to him with a glow in her eyes. You're very, you're a very attractive man, she raised his, she raised her eyebrows expertly. I was afraid it might come to this, Gavin thought fretfully. I'll have to head her off to the pass. Damn it, I'll have to. I'll have earned every last penny I get for that bracelet. He spotted a bottle of mineral oil on the mineral water on the bar. Speaking of health, he stammered out as he fumbled out of his seat and over to the bar. I bet you haven't had your six to eight glasses of water today. Allow me to pour you one. In a setting such as this, I prefer champagne, Veronica cooed. 
Gavin lunged for the glasses, twisted open a dark green bottle of Plurilino, and hurriedly poured it sparkling contents, causing it to bubble up and overflow. Grabbing a cocktail napkin, he mopped it up. But this has bubbles too, and you can't drink so much, much more of it, he laughed with a nervous relief as she beamed and accepted it from him. She had had a couple of whiskey sours, wine, and a cappuccino at dinner, he cal calculated rapidly. A couple of these should send her scurrying to the loo. And with any luck, that dress will take minutes to negotiate around the toilet seat. Suddenly back on the couch, Veronica patted the cushion next to her and mentioned to Gavin. Besides the pigs and the blankets, always good to have a wheel of brie at a party, don't you think? Relieved to move through the ship on her own, Reagan wandered through the casino, hoping to spot her parents. They were already gone from the dining room when their table got up, and she had phoned them, but as expected, they were not in their room. As she walked by the slot machines, a bell rang, followed by a tiny sound of quarters dropping into a tray of machine that had just lined up a winning combination of three cherries in a row. And an expressionless man with a chewed-up cigar hanging out of one side of his mouth scooped up the quarters and dropped them back in his paper cup. No matter how much you win at these one-armed bandits, Reagan thought these people keep playing until they used up all their change. Reagan had heard it was the best to play the machines near their entrances. The victorious sound of the ring of bells attract people wandering by, and no doubt the cruise line hopes they'll respond like Pearl of Og's dogs. The blackjack tables were full, and Reagan noticed that Cameron Hardock was already seated in one, and a waitress was serving him a drink. I don't want to get involved with him, Reagan thought. Fixing her eyes straight in front of her, she kept walking. Exiting the casino and passing through the corridor with the photo displays, which tomorrow will be filled with the smiling face of those old who attended the captain's party tonight. She remembered that Veronica said they must order extra copies as she was sure her cousins would want a copy as well as Philip and Val. Val rec recently dug out some of the old family pictures in the attic, Veronica has said, and is having them framed. Except, of course, the pictures of Sir Gilbert's first wife. She looked like a pleasant enough lady, but I don't really want, need to be reminded that there was ever anyone else in Sir Gilbert's life. Too bad, because there is a striking one of, of Sir Gilbert as a young man, but she is in it, and although I don't understand... Oh no. Although I understand she was very good to him right up until the time she died. Who needs to look at her? Reagan reached the door of the night's lounge and looked in. It amazed her the way it took on a whole other aura in the evening. The lights were low, candles flickered on the tables, and the people who had played bingo in this room a few hours ago in their shorts were now all dressed up. No wonder romance flourished at night, Reagan thought. People looked better at candlelight. It certainly was the subject of many songs. Will you still love me tomorrow? Gee, probably not. A magician had just finished his routine and thankfully did a disappearing act himself. The band struck up and couples took to the floor as the female singer cooned, Ooh, did you tell her you love her? And do you miss her so badly? Time to go down to the disco, Reagan thought, as she located all the younger folks. I may as well check out that bar scene and it's like the middle of the Atlantic. Grabbing the railing of the back staircase as the ship took a sudden dip to one side, Reagan felt oddly relaxed. She enjoyed having a little time to herself to think. Dinner had been a long, had been long, and she didn't feel like any more conversation for conversation's sake. Reagan took a place at one of the tables set back from the dance floor. Strobe lights revol revolved around and around, making colored circles and dots on the ceilings floors and walls. As if there isn't enough movement on this ship to make you seasick, she thought. The music was blasting as it could only at a disco. So many men, so little time. Not the problem here, Reagan thought, surveying the room. So few women, so much time. What did I say? So few men, so much time. 
on land, she would have had she would have had a hating going to a place like this alone. But there was something about life on board ship that changed all the rules. We're all on this journey together, making new friends who will spend send Christmas cards to the re for the rest of our lives. The captain had said in one of his fireside chats over the public address system. Clearly, the captain loved the sound of his own voice. They had already been subject to several of his monologues, and it was only on the second day out. Any excuse, and he would have grabbed his microphone. He got on to tell them exactly where they were, how many nocturnal miles they had traveled, how far away from was the closest land, etc. When Reagan looked out the window, it always looked the same, no matter what information the captain had shared. What was that saying? Water, water everywhere, and not a drop. A drink, ma'am? Reagan looked up. Ma'am, I'll kill him. She ordered a vod vod vodka and tonic from the young waiter who sported a crew cut and handlebar mustache. Opening her purse, she reached, reached for her notebook. Jotting down thoughts that were fresh in her mind had become second nature to, to her. Now she wrote Livingston's sympathy note. Tomorrow, she'd ask Livingston for the address of Athena's parents. She wanted to write to them. Hello. Reagan looked up and smiled at Lloyd, the bingo A.D. camp. He was standing over her, looking tall and boyishly handsome in his whites. Nothing like a man in uniform, Reagan thought. Mind if I join you? Not at all, Reagan replied as she slipped her notebook back into her purse. My God, she must be a camel, Gavin thought as she pour as he poured yet another glass of water for Veronica, who showed no telltale signs of her bladder strain. Either that or she invested in a box of deep ends. A half hour ago, he'd been particularly doubled over in pain and used the facilities himself. But she seemed oblivious to the call of nature. Veronica had finished circling her selections from the party menu. I do hope these hors d'oeuvres are tasty enough. Since I am not at home with my own secret ingredients, I won't be able to docker them up. A true chef knows how to fuss with the dish and make it more interesting. And now, Mr. Gray, we must figure out how many people I've invited so we can order accordingly. Do you think we should invite some of the ship's officers, maybe even the captain? I don't care, Gavin thought wildly, his eyes riveted on the closet door. P, damn it, P. Veronica rushed on. I would love to finally be at a party where there are more men than women. We've already invited everyone at the table. Which well, should be pleasant. I just hope that Cameron Hardwick is in a festive mood. I must remember to tell Reagan that Violet Cohn insists she met him in Greece several years ago. Mr. Gray, what are you staring at? Lloyd was a good dancer, Reagan realized. She was enjoying herself. But when, she, when the set ended and he proposed a walk on the deck, she glanced at her watch and said, I better get upstairs. I don't like to be away from Lady Exner far too long. Harper looked disappointed and said, I guess you're right. I saw her almost fall over the side yesterday, and it's been known to happen. I think we have everything in order, Mr. Gray. This is going to be such a good show, Veronica turned as she heard Reagan's key in the door. Oh, lovely, Reagan's back. I wonder who she's talking to out there. Another chance shot to hell, Gavin thought, with an ever escalating level of frustration felt inside his pounding head. Glass after glass of the bubbling water had given him a headache. Reagan entered, smiling. Reagan, did you have a nice time? Veronica asked gleefully. Veronica, you got your wish. This guy from Bingo asked me to dance. Oh, I can't wait to hear about it, Veronica said. Veronica said eagerly, but first, if you will excuse me. Gavin sat there in disbelief as she as he watched her slam the bathroom door shut. Thank you, Reagan said to him as she took a seat. You're so nice to help her out with the planning part part with the plan oh Jesus. Out with the party planning. Gavin's smile was a glimpse of pain. 
The pleasure was all mine, he stood up. I'll let you two have a chance to chat before bed. Tomorrow morning, please bring her to the sit-and-be-fit class again. I'll be there. Probably every day this week. Now, I really, I must really be going. He let himself out. Reagan took off her clothes and put on her robe. Veronica re-emerged and quivered. Where is Mr. Gray? I think he was tired. He said he'll see you in the morning. Oh, poor fellow must be. He's so thoughtful. But tonight I caught him just staring into space. He takes his, his responsibilities on this ship too seriously. That he's busy from early in the morning until late at night. Veronica turned for Reagan to unzip her dress. I had to use the facility so desperately. But he's so generous with his time. I didn't want to leave him for a moment. It was embarrassing enough having to go this morning. Naturally, I turned on the tap. Veronica retreated into the dressing area as Reagan pulled out the couch. You can't go to sleep, Reagan, until you tell me all about your ventures tonight. Perhaps you should invite this young man to our party. It's going to be smashing. I'm sure everyone would love to have the chance to meet him. Reagan pulled the covers over her head and thought three and a half days to go. Wednesday, June 24th. Bright sunshine steamed through the portholes as Luke and Nora sat in com companionable silence, sipping their morning coffee and sharing the miniature shipboard newspaper that was shipped, no, that was slipped under their door each day. Darling, what should we plan to do today? Nora asked she picked up a copy of the daily program. A knock on the door precluded a response. Oh, baby. Hi. Sorry. Could it be? Nora asked as Luke opened the door. I want my coffee. Bregan yelled, imitating Nora's roommate from a brief hospital stay earlier in the year. Well, come in and shut the door before the men in their white jackets take you away. Oh, baby, did you have to walk? Thank you. Sorry. Well, uh, one almost did last night. What, dear? Never mind. Reagan mumbled as she slipped in the chair opposite Nora and poured herself a cup of cup from their breakfast cart. There's nothing like the cur third cup of the day. It's okay. I was finished anyway, Luke said wearily as he sat down in a love seat. Oh, sorry, Dad. If you don't mind, I'm going to put through another cup. Eli, are you done walking on me? Okay. You all right? Yeah. You okay? Okay. Uh. Oh. Oh, sorry, Dad. If you don't mind, I'm going to put through another phone call. So sit here. Nora looked curious. Who are you calling now? The inspector in Oxford again. I want to see if he had any luck with getting the newspapers from Greece. Reagan frowned. Isn't it too much of a coincidence that two people from the same family were murdered within months of each other? I don't know. There's got to be a connection. Reagan, what are you saying? I guess I'm hoping that someone in those Greek papers will jump out at me. Nora hesitated. I've always taught you to trust your instincts, but after the way that psychic reacted to you yesterday, Reagan, she was afraid for you. Mom, that woman is a quack. You know what she's doing today? Reagan did not wait for her an answer. Running a scarf tying session. Give me a break. The next thing you know, she'll be selling crystal balls with the Green Guinevere logo. I bet she just needed a free ride across the pond. Reagan scooped up a blueberry muffin crumbs from Luke's plate and dropped them into her mouth. Ray Nora handed her a napkin as Reagan got up and walked over to the phone. Besides, even though we weren't close, I wish I had made more of an effort with Athena. Oxford Carrying a piping hot cup of tea, Nigel Livingston walked down the 
drab hallway of the police station in Oxford, heading for the last door on the left, his office. My home away from home, he mused, with pictures of his wife and daughter adoring his massive desk. He quickened his pace when he heard his phone ringing, causing the steaming brew to spill over on his stubby fingers. Oh, buggers! He muttered angrily as the tea dripped down the side of the cup and splashed on the gray tile floor. The call was from Reagan Riley. Just a second, Miss Riley. With the receiver in one hand, Livingston circled his desk, sat down on his swivel chair. The file on the Porpolos case was open on his desk. The first faxes from Greece had just arrived. He had spared them all out, anxious to read the new material as well as go over his notes when he had gone for a cup of tea. On the other end, Reagan held out her cup as Luke freshened it with the last few drops of coffee in the pot. Thanks, Lukey. Beg your pardon, Nigel said, asked. Oh, sorry, Reagan replied. I'm calling from my parents' room. They're heading home from a trip to to Europe, and at quote and suddenly were booked on the same crossing. Didn't I hear your mother is a mystery writer? Writer? Yes. And by the way, I haven't told Lady Exner she's on board. She's rather anxious for my mother to write the story of her life. She can be quite determined. I understand, Livingston replied, as he remembered the discussion he had yesterday with Philip Whitcomb and his fiancée. Has Lady Exner expressed any concern for Miss Atwater's condition? Not really, although she did say that it was probably better Penopoli, Penopoli, Jesus, Penop Penelope wasn't along. With all the food they serve here, Pen Penelope would be, have been eating all day and night and ended up with a perennial case of heartburn. Veronica said there was nothing more frustrating than traveling with someone who's always sick and complaining. Reagan twirled the cord in her fingers, suddenly uneasy. Why do you ask? To get right to the point, do you think Veronica might have had tried to eliminate Miss Atwater? Levinson asked. Absolutely not. Then let's put it in a different way, Livingston continued. From all accounts, Miss Atwater had become something of a nuisance to Lady Exner. Do you think that she might have wanted to make it impossible for Miss Atwater to travel? Reagan thought to herself, oh, I suppose it's possible, but... Replied, I don't believe that. I noticed some hesitation in your voice, Miss Riley. It's not to be there. I didn't even tell her about the arsenic found in Penelope's system because I didn't want her to worry her, want to worry her. As far as Veronica knows, Penelope is suffering from a case of food poisoning. Nothing more. I was over at Le Lulin Hall yesterday, and Philip Whipcomb and his fiance mentioned that Lady Exner had joked about sprinkling a little bit of arsenic on those or divorce. Philip mentioned that? Reagan sounded incredulous. Well, Miss Twyler brought it up first. Which brings me to another matter. I saw your classmate, Claire James, yesterday, and she talked about Athena taking a fancy fancy to Philip. She says Athena had bicycled past Llewellyn Hall to see him. Do you think Philip could have been even a little keen on Athena? Reagan furrowed her brows. I really don't think so, but I just can't be sure. Athena and I never really did get did anything together. Claire has a talent for fretting out the, that kind of information. She was always in the middle of whatever gossip was going on in the dorm. Who was dating whom, whose boyfriend was from the States, was coming to visit. That's rather the impression I got, Livingston glanced down in his notes. One final thing. In Miss Populos's jacket pocket, we found a matchbook from the Bull and Bear with initials and a few numbers on it. We're trying to tra track that down and see if we can come up with anything useful. Do the initials B.A. mean anything to you? B.A., Reagan thought. P.A. I don't think so. How about the numbers 315? No. Well, 
In the meantime, I just received the first set of faxes from Greece. Athena's small hometown newspaper in Skolios is published every Wednesday, which is today. So we have we should have the translated version of that by tomorrow. Hopefully you'll have the first lot sometime this morning. Good. If anything strikes me about BA or 315 while I'm reading the papers, I'll give you a call. Then she remembered to ask for the address of Athena's parents. She hung up, sure, or she would have to field questions from her parents about the suspicion cast on Veronica. I should get some faxes today, she told them quickly. Right now they're just trying to follow whatever leads they can. I better go get Veronica and bring her up to the poetry seminar. What are you two up to? Nora's expression changed. I was going to go to that as well, but I think I'll pass. Let's see what else they have listed. Oh dear, they're having a contest at that time for all the grandparents on board. They're giving out prizes for whoever has the oldest grandchild, whoever has the youngest. Maybe we'll be eligible for that in a couple years. Goodbye, folks! Reagan muttered as she shut the door behind her, wishing for the umpteenth time she were one of ten children, at least one of whom had made her an aunt by now. Thank you.